So uh, we actually uh, have set up a lineup, which I, th I think this is, I think, is the most exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason. It's because uh, uh, the focus is on AI, but it's not actually AI as a buzzword, but rather start to dig down into specific aspects of AI. And there is an order into this presentation. So we'll have uh, the first presenter giving you an overview. And then we have uh, aspects of uh, automation of education. We have aspects around the implication of AI in relation to learning design and instruction. And then we have, uh, uh, if you want to have more data in, how do you then uh, find out ways to improve the AI? And then we have uh, a meta uh, meso perspective around uh, AI in the fourth industry, the, the forces around us that are actually pushing AI. And then we have uh, two uh, last two, two speakers that uh, it's kind of a zoom out again in two different ways. So I think all the speakers are here. Are they all here? Are they all? Yes, I was looking for you, man. So we can we get to go. They all have 10 minutes, and then we have time for questions. So I would like to invite the first speaker, uh, Mr. Chan Kai Tsang. He's going to talk about current application and challenges of implementing AI in medical education. Floor is yours. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and members of the floor. I'm Kai Tsang, a uniform medical student from the Conscious School of Medicine. Today, I'll be talking to you about this topic, an integrative review on the current applications and challenges of implementing AI in medical education. So this is a brief overview of what I'll be covering. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, artificial intelligence will be referred to as AI. So firstly, what is AI? It's founded by John McCarley in 1955. And AI is defined as a machine with intelligent behavior and the ability to perform human tasks. AI is currently used in several areas, such as automotives, finance and economics, medicine, and education. However, in medical education, AI has been less explored until recent years. Interestingly, a preliminary search in Web of Science for the use of AI in medical education demonstrated an increasing trend with an increase in total number of publications and number of times cited over the last two decades. This reflects an increasing enthusiasm in the field of AI in medical education. So in this age of rapidly advancing technology, there's a need to report the scholarly work that has been done for AI in medical education. So this set up two main research questions that I have. Firstly, how is AI currently used in medical education? And secondly, what are the challenges in implementing AI in medical education? An integrative review of peer review literature was performed for the following databases. Medline Ovid, ESCO host Eric and Education Source, and Web of Science. And this was last performed on 14th of August 2018. The inclusion criteria includes any feature of AI, such as machine learning and deep learning. With regards to exclusion criteria, articles on other aspects of education, apart from medical education, were excluded. The use of technology, other than which excludes, without the use of AI, was also excluded. Reviews, letters and commentaries, non-English texts, as well as articles published before date, due to the lack of online archiving of journals, were also excluded from this study. The titles and effects were screened for previously identified search criteria, and relevant articles were then assessed in full text. The relevant data was recorded, and two models were used to analyze the data. Firstly, the extension of technology acceptance model, as well as the diffusion of innovation theory model, and quantitative data was analyzed with SPSS. This slide shows the Prisma figure uh, for this integrative review. The 34 articles were identified after screening and examination of the full text. All 34 of them reported on the current use of AI in medical education, with 31 of them reporting the challenges of implementing AI. As mentioned in the previous slide, three main users of AI were identified. Firstly, one article identified on curriculum review, majority on learning support, as four articles on the assessment of learning. With regards to the use of AI for learning support, 
the main reason for its use is the ability to provide feedback, with 72.4% of the articles stating so. I also performed a subgroup analysis on the target audience. Majority of the articles targeted medical students, 13 of them on postgraduate training, and 8 of them on continuing medical education, also known as CME. Moving on to the challenges. Three main challenges were also identified from the articles. 21 of them on the perceived usefulness of AI, 3 on the perceived ease of use of AI, and 21 on the, dif on the difficulties of technical aspects of AI. With regards to the perceived usefulness of AI, the main challenge is the difficulty in assessing the effectiveness of AI. Others include the limited scalability, the possibility of a failure of an AI system, as well as the overgeneralization of medical concepts. With regards to the technical difficulties of AI, challenges included the need for large sample size, the need for a knowledgeable content expert, a need for multidisciplinary team due to the gaps in knowledge, as well as a lack of a general architecture for the due to the multifaceted nature of clinical problems. Moving on to the discussion. Interestingly, only one of the articles were, was about curricular review, despite the several advantages AI can have over traditional methods. One possible reason for this is due to the lack of digitalization of curriculum map, which is required for curriculum review. In addition, a large data pool is required for curriculum review as well. So this could be one of the reasons for the lack of use in curriculum review. With regards to learning support, the ability of AI to provide feedback was cited as the main reasons for its use. Feedback is critical for identifying knowledge gaps, and students need to know and students need to know how they are performing in order to take measures on improving themselves. An AI system is able to provide immediate and formative feedback on students' performance. However, we can compromise on the quality of the feedback received. This is likely to be true. Moving back to the table that was shown earlier, an interesting finding is that medical undergraduates are the main target audience, with 21 papers of them citing them, whereas only 8 papers included CME. A possible reason for this is due to the lack of structured curriculum of CME. Another possible reason is, could be the intent to, to shape students' way of learning at an earlier point of their medical career. A study by Shin et al. demonstrated that undergraduates who adopted problem-based learning are more likely to retain information as compared to those who, who take up traditional methods of, of learning. The use of AI enhances the problem-based learning by providing step guidance and the provision of feedback. Similar to the use in curriculum assessment, only a small, only a minority of them discuss about the use in assessment of learning. However, why? Since AI is also able to provide feedback, this is likely due to the lack of digitalization as mentioned earlier. In addition, due to the sensitive nature of summative assessments, this could limit the use of AI. A malfunction in the system of the AI, of the AI system could lead to dire consequences on the student's performance. Moving on to the challenges. Difficulty in assessing the effectiveness of AI was the most commonly reported challenge. There are two major issues here. Firstly, in order to assess the effectiveness of AI as compared to traditional methods, these studies need to have a large sample size for the results to be probabilistic, and clear surrogate markers such as pre- and post-test scores are required. Secondly, the issue of explainability, and this is more specific for deep learning, which is a subset of AI. With regards to deep learning, there's no explanation on how the AI system actually arrives at the answer. However, in medical education, the thought process is extremely crucial for students as students need to know how they actually come up with the differential diagnosis. Take for instance, chest pain. There are several causes of chest pain. You will have to look at the epidemiology, risk factors, and the character of chest pain, etc. There are several causes, such as the cardiac origin, which could be myocardial infarction, a pulmonary origin, such as pulmonary embolism, or gastric origin, such as a reflux disease. And students need to work on their clinical reasoning in order to come up with differential diagnosis 
to rule out, to avoid missing out on atypical presentations. <coughs> In addition, there's also a need for a multidisciplinary team, as mentioned earlier. Due, due to the different roles involved, a physician needs to ensure clinical relevance and accuracy of the AI system, whereas data scientists are involved in the management of the large pools of data, and a multidisciplinary team is required to ensure the effectiveness of an AI system in medical education. With regards to the limitations of this study, there's a wide spectrum of applications of AI in medical education that was assessed. However, the practices in each subspecialty may vary, such as general surgery, anesthesia, and internal medicine. Secondly, a low number of studies on the use of AI in curriculum review and assessment of learning was found, as the conclusion for the latter may not be representative. Future research can be done in, in areas to assess the effectiveness of AI, to compare the use of AI with traditional methods of teaching, and there could be a possibility of reviewing AI with the use of immersive reality, such as virtual reality and augmented reality. These are the references. I would like to thank our Medical Education Research and Scholarship Unit and Professor Nabil Zari for this, for making this possible. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think everything is crystal clear. <laughs> Unless there's one. There's one other. Uh, just very general. What was the quality of the Firstly, this is an integrative review rather than a systematic review. So I did not, uh, there was no quality assurance of the articles that were involved because uh, this was also uh, a scholarly <coughs> project work, uh, from LKC Medicine, so there was a limited time frame. So uh, I was unable to assess the quality of the articles. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, hopefully that gives us an overview of the field of AI. So I would like to uh, invite the next speaker, uh, Gideon going to talk about uh, rethinking the teacher-student interaction through AI-enabled feedback and grading. The floor is yours. Thank you. If you manage to connect to your computer yeah, through. Uh, but that's LQC, it should work. <laughs> so, so first of all, uh, this is uh, ongoing experimentation. So what I'll show you is no working system. No, nothing that actually uh, is currently uh, in our scope that, that, that functionally works, but some of the work in progress that we have in the, in the way. Can, can everybody hear? Yeah. It's, it's better like this, right? Or do you want it? Yeah? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I, oh, is, it, is this better? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So um, I'll try and, and give you some perspective of the way we, uh, you know, thinking, we are thinking about using AI. Um, and uh, I, I hope you uh, disagree and give your ideas so we can take them and then in the next uh, 12 to 18 months continue working on it. Um, so, uh, how do we do, and I want to focus on teaching transformation. I think AI has a lot of uh, impact on the way we teach. And I wanted to actually start with a picture from, uh, this is 1910. So this, this is a picture about what the classroom would look like in the year 2000. And I think that's an important thing to start with because <laughs> I am now and we are here trying to explore, I think, what the classroom would look like 100 years from now, and we're gonna get it wrong. Uh, some elements might be interesting to, to keep in mind, but it, again, it's very hard to um, manage uh, the present from the future. Um, and in this, in this case, you see a professor putting books, the textbooks, in a machine and uh, destroying them <laughs> and putting them directly in the brains of the students. Um, not a very collaborative classroom. There's a student assistant, I guess, here working. It's a very uh, one-way direction. I think we have different ideas now about what teaching uh, looks like. So I, I guess this is, a, this is an image of how AI would have uh, been thought of you know, back in the day. Um, so, AI for education, why is it now all of a sudden 
what, what has happened, and I think there is four elements that are important to, to keep in mind, is that the recent advances in technology have brought science fiction into the realm of the possible, and uh, essentially brought together the idea of that you have an enterprise bot framework. That you, who uses WhatsApp? Great. Uh, who uses Slack? Good. Can somebody explain what Slack is to people who have never used it? A virtual meeting environment. Actually, it's, it's like an email killer because <laughs> it brings chat into the workspace. And uh, more and more students like to use chat when they uh, interact uh, with each other. And this, this chat framework, this bot framework of chat is a, is a new technology that is coming into the workspace. And this is where AI can make a big difference. Uh, the other thing that came is natural language processing, the ability of machine to read natural language and interact with that. that. That combined with machine learning APIs, which are essentially connectors that you can just plug into. So you have IBM Watson, you can just fire a question and give you something back. Whether it's useful is a second order. Uh, Google has a similar API, it's free. Um, and so there are some others. And uh, big data stacks. Essentially, you, you need, in order to train these machines, you need lots and lots of data. And the problem with a lot of the learning data that we have in classrooms is that it's not captured in any unstructured or structured way that we can make sense of it. Uh, so, and, and that is changing as we are capturing more and more data. So I think that this is the framework through which you can look at how AI can impact um, education. So um, this is the digital learning strategy at, at Imperial. And uh, what we're trying to do is essentially do experimentation around three areas, or combining the three areas. One is the experience that our students and, and teachers have, and in this case, the teacher experience. The second is uh, extending it beyond our campus. So what we do, we really want to share with the rest of the world. Um, and that opens the opportunity to get more and more data. So that is a way. So MOOCs, for example, is a way for us to get so much data that we can then train, perhaps, the machine. That's at least the idea. And the third one is innovation, which is really about how do we use the latest technology that I was just referring to uh, in, in that. Uh, in that. <coughs> so two, I wanted to highlight two examples that we've been uh, working on. Uh, some of it has been very prototype uh, based, it's nowhere near a place where it works. And to be honest, we've been looking at what companies have been doing. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity of chatting with uh, your bank provider, for example, or, right? Uh, and, and that's still a human on the other side. And slowly they're experimenting with automated bots coming in and giving you like feedback and answering parts of your question. But nobody has got it right yet. And I, th I think we're in this stage where it's really pioneering work uh, to get it to work properly. But there's two areas where, where we can do something in education. One is virtual tutors and teachers and student support. So essentially, would it be an idea where we uh, take away a lot of the the first line of questions that actually academics don't have to answer. Uh, we found that a lot of academics are answering questions that are not really relevant to them. Like, where is the, when is the next session? Where is the next session? Uh, where do I revise this? It's, it's kind of standard FAQs that if we can find a way of getting students to uh, go to a chat, we can actually have a help desk almost. To, to filter the first line questions before the real academic and the harder questions get sent to the academic. So that, that's kind of the vision. Um, the same goes, and actually one experiment that I, I can't show, you should talk to uh, Rebecca Fletcher, who's done the curriculum mapping at Imperial using Sophia. They've now experimented with the Echo, the Alexa Echo, to ask it questions and give you back the curriculum um, as you uh, as you need it based on the questions that you ask. So that's the Echo, Amazon Echo. Um, and what we've been uh, trialing right now is we're we're implementing Slack as a as a way of allowing students to communicate uh, in the online degree. And as part of that, we're building a bot that will capture the student questions and slowly start answering some of them. 
Now, where are we in this development? We're really at the development of we first have to have the platform through which we gain, gain all that data before we can really build that bot. So we have the functionality in place, but we first have to really talk about how do we engage students in this new online environment. And only if we can prove that the student communication with the tutors and each other is effective through this platform, we can train the bot to the degree that it, that it works. Um, so that's one area of, uh, of development. And the second is the auto grader. Is, uh, as I said before, I think grading and the time that we take for grading is, it takes a lot of time. If we can ease that burden, and again, we, we started by thinking, oh, AI will solve all our problems. Well, it won't <laughs> yet. Uh, but what we then started to do is build a grading support system and figuring out how do we support um, features when they get, let's say, 400 or 800 uh, exams filled in paper, uh, how do we stand up in a way that then is presented to the teacher that you can distribute or she can distribute it to other markers um, and then annotate so we can actually improve also the way we provide feedback to students. So that, that would be the first layer before you can even think about AI. So I guess the, the conclusion is that we, we started to think about solving these problems through AI, but we found out that you actually need the architecture and the processes in place before you can actually experiment more deeply with implementing AI. And that's what we're trying to do now. And I, I'd like any thoughts of technologies or ideas for process improvement from this audience so we can take that uh, back further. But I wanted to leave you with uh, one of uh, my favorite writers, Hannah Arendt, um, who wrote on violence. And this is a cautionary point about the use of AI and also our responsibility as human beings to not only to, to also use real intelligence uh, to, to, to harness uh, AI for good. Because uh, she wrote this in, uh, I think it was the 60s, and she said, bureaucracy, or the rule by intricate systems of bureaus in which no man, neither one nor the best, neither the few nor the many, can be held responsible, and which could be properly called the rule by nobody. Indeed, if we identify tyranny as the government that is not held to give account of itself, rule by nobody is clearly the most tyrannical of all, since there is no one who left who could even be asked to answer for what is being done. It is this state of affairs which is amongst the most potent causes of the current worldwide rebellious unrest. And I think if you replace uh, <coughs> bureau uh, bureaucracy by system, and uh, in a way the way these systems are developed, these platforms are developing, there is, there is an issue there uh, about uh, civic space, about public space, uh, that you also have to take care of uh, when you're thinking about partnering sometimes with companies or with organizations around this topic. And that, that's maybe a slightly different tune to the AI uh, debate that you would expect, but thought it was important to mention. Questions to give you? <coughs> or proposals or recommendations or systems or feedback? Okay. So now we have the overview. We have the, uh, uh, which I think is very good, is uh, what to think about when you come into AI. What are the uh, actually the steps to engage into AI and uh, the ethical dilemma that may arise? The next speaker is James, um, and he's going to be talking about artificial intelligence and learning design, technical and pedagogical opportunities. I'm looking forward to hear how you address the uh, the topic of AI and the learning design.
good afternoon, everyone. While the computer wakes up, maybe I'll just say a few introductory words. Uh, I'm James Thiel, I live in Sydney, Australia, and probably my main contribution related to this field is in the field of learning design, which is a broader area of study than just medical education. But it's had quite some uh, significant impact in medical education because learning design allows you to describe sequences of activities that you want students to work through, and very often they are uh, sequences of collaborative activities. So rather than traditional AI, where it might be a single learner going through some sophisticated pathway that the computer has determined for them, or they're working away and the AI is recommending ideas or answers or problems to them. In learning design, you typically have a group of students working through a sort of activity, be it online or face-to-face. -face. So those of you who know the team-based learning uh, structure that's run here at uh, LKC, the software that underlies that is what's called the LAM software. That's been my main work for the last 15 years. And so what I'll do is take that as a kind of foundation to talk a bit about how can artificial intelligence and learning design come together? What are some of the opportunities for connection, but what are also some of the challenges there? So we'll see if we've got any slides here. Stand around the computer, but I think we'll get a bit of squashy. So I can go around it. So the thing to do. <laughs> Best I can do. I'll oh, pull. Perhaps while it's either, let me tell you a little bit of background. So let me just check how many of you know of the TDL structure that's been used here at LKC. Can I just get a sense of it in the room? Okay, so some but not all. So we've got the car. Good. Let me see if I can get out drive it. Okay. All right, so um, as I mentioned, my work is prim primarily in learning design. That's what I know uh, best of all. It's one of the really innovative areas of educational technology or e-learning generally. It's had quite some impact in medical education and here at LKC, Places like Western Sydney Medical School in uh, Western Sydney University Medical School in uh, Australia and a range of others, and it's primarily because it provides technology to provide a, a sequence or a flow of activities for students to work together. So you can run PBL-based activities through a learning design system. You can run TBL, team-based learning, essentially any kind of structured pedagogy where you have particular tasks you want students to do over time. If you want to run that online or you want to do a hybrid of some online tasks, some face-to-face, -face, <coughs> maybe back to online. That's the sort of thing that a learning design system is ideal for. Possibly the most important part of learning design, though, is that when a uh, lecturer, an educator, creates a set of activities that they want to run their students through, that set of activities becomes a reusable thing in its own right. So if I create a really great set of activities for teaching a particular topic, I can then give that to any other colleague. They can then look at it and say, oh, that's it. I like the way you designed that. I might use that myself. Or they can then start to adapt it and tweak it. I'll show you an example of this in a moment that will help make a bit sense of that. But what learning design does is it brings collaborative learning and structured or sequenced learning to an online environment. I think one of the funniest things for me is if you look at typical learning management systems, which often struggle to do this kind of thing, they will provide the tools for you that might do it. You might say, well, I want you to look at this resource, I then want you to go to this discussion forum and have this discussion, I then want you to break up into groups, go to a wiki and in your group, develop your own ideas, and then present that back to your whole class. That might be the pedagogy you have in mind. The tools are all there, but there's nothing that actually steps the students through and knows what they've done. That's the difference with learning design. So it actually steps students through the tasks and it keeps a record of what that flow of tasks was. That turns out to be very important for AI at the moment because the system knows what the students are supposed to be doing rather than there just being a collection of tools on an LMS page but the system knows nothing about the underlying pedagogy. So it's a little bit about learning design. Artificial intelligence obviously is a major thing both within our society generally and within education. We've got two great presentations to start to give us some overview on that, so I won't say too much more on that. Just particularly for medical education, why might learning design and AI be relevant? 
I think the complexity of the content domain in medical education is extraordinary. And there's you know, so much to learn in so many areas with so many connections between them. Then if AI can help us to map that, to teach it, to help students correct their misunderstandings, it's a very attractive concept. So I can easily see why AI comes into it. But learning designs offer is particularly collaborative learning. And as I think you know, we all know now in, in uh, medical education, the ability to work in teams, the ability to work in multidisciplinary teams in many different healthcare contexts is a crucial part of the education of the next generation of doctors and other healthcare professionals. So if all they've learned is to study on their own, to have a great deal of content knowledge, to answer exam questions, and that's all they take out into the workplace. They are not prepared for the workplace of tomorrow. They need to know how to work with teams. They need to collaborate with others. So that's where um, collaborative learning is particularly strong in learning design. So how might we bring these uh, together? The thing is, there's some quite important technical and pedagogical challenges to making this reality. And so I want to just talk through a few of them today. All right. Probably the key thing to know is that in a learning design system, is that working out? Great. Um, the opportunity for artificial intelligence, one of the most important things, what we call branching. This is where you have a set of activities that students are working through, and then they might go off on different branches to do different tasks, be it in different groups or different topic areas, all of that's possible. So let me just show you briefly what this might look like practically. If you haven't seen this before, this is the LAMS authoring system. This is where uh, an educator can create a sequence of activities for students to work through. So at the left-hand side, there's a whole palette of tools, forum, chats, contents, you, know, you name it, all those sort of things. You would drag and drop them into this main area, connect them together, and that would form the sequence of activities that the students would work through. This is to get step them through saying, well, now you've got a forum, and here's your topic to discuss. Now there are three websites to look at, here are the websites. Now you're going off into wikis, here's a wiki for each subject, whatever it might be, it will step them through that. So I want you to notice the bit I've circled here in red. That's a point where, if you imagine you had, say, 30 students going through this sequence together, there comes a point where they can then go in different directions. And so this might be a branch where there's advanced content available for one group and more remedial content available for another. So that's one way you could use a branch. Another one could be just two different topics and you allow students to choose according to their preference. It also could be two different types of tasks. One might be a team-based task, one might be on their own. So there's no limit to what you can do, and although this particular branch has only got one activity on it, you can have many, many activities on a branch. So you can have many tasks for each branch to work through, and if you're wondering, yes, you can do branches within branches. And so you can actually have very complicated pathways of multiple activities of different kinds of students to go through. I've just done a very simple one here because I want to just get the basic concept across. Because if you look at that, I hope you can see that's a point where AI could help us. So let me now sort of step this out. Currently in learning design technology, the way branching is done is based on the teacher or the tutor who's running the session can hand allocate students to branches. If students are already in groups, like a TBL group, they can go off on branches according to a TBL group. Or you can have a quiz, and based on the quiz score, you can go off on certain branches. You know, those who did very well can go to the advanced content branch. Those who didn't quite do so well can go to the remedial content branch. So all of that can happen today. All of that's available right now. But I think what AI gives us is a few opportunities. One is if you had an AI model that allowed you to determine where students were at in their learning and what their weaknesses were and what their strengths, you could actually ask the AI to decide which branch should the student go on. Rather than just a simple quiz, it could be a much more sophisticated view of all the things that the student has learned. So if I can just show you what that might look like. Looking here, if we imagine now we have some AI engine, you know, just let's call it a black box for the moment. We've got some kind of AI, and what we do is we connect it into that point where the branching would happen and say, all right, it is now the job of the AI to decide which branch the students go on rather than the teacher or just a, a simple quiz school. So that's an immediate, obvious, quite easy to implement point where you can bring AI straight into all the existing infrastructure of hybrid learning. And honestly, you can do that tomorrow. It's all there, it's all ready to go. So that's one opportunity I'd point to, as I say, not, it's not particularly complicated. The complicated bit will be the AI model that then makes judgments about what happens. But in terms of just slotting it in in an architecture sense, it's pretty simple. 
The second one I want to suggest is another thing that uh, is possible in lean design is in addition to the sequence of activities that you have, you may have additional support activities. I think of these like optional tasks. Students don't have to do them, they're not in the flow of tasks, but they're there to help. Now these could be content resources, you know, knowledge database, any number of things that, that could be available, but they're, 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 their point is they're not essential to getting through the sequence, they're there as a help. Well, if you think about AI, again, this is a point where the AI could be watching the student's progress through the sequence, watching for certain kinds of failures of understanding or taking too long to do an activity, whatever it might be. And so then the AI might jump in and say, look, I would particularly recommend you consider this support activity. Spend a bit of time here before you keep going in the sequence. And so here, rather than the AI making a direct decision of pedagogy, go this branch versus go that branch, now the AI is there as a, 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 an advisor and a supporter. You know, effectively the AI is saying, I have watched your progress, compared to other people's progress, you have seem to be weak in this area, I may not be saying this out loud, but that's effectively what it's doing. Therefore I recommend this extra time. So that's another point where it can come in. And then the other one, and this is perhaps one of the great questions, is where do we get the models for the AI in the first place? Where do we actually get the information to drive the AI so it knows what is good learning, what is poor learning, you know, what pathways are successful and what aren't? This is where learning designers field really sets itself apart from traditional LMSs. Because a friend of mine who's worked in learning, learning analytics said he had a, a particular LMS, he set up a set of activities where students went and looked at a resource, and they went to a discussion forum and talked about that, and then they did a quiz. That was, that was what they do. And so in the LMS they had these three elements and some text to say this is what you should do. So they ran this with hundreds and hundreds of students. They went and got this learning analytics data, 10,000 plus points of data. They ran it through this complicated machine learning, and machine learning came back and said, what we've learned is that most students go first to the resource, <laughs> then they go to the forum, and then they do the quiz. Like, yes, that's what they've been told to do. How is that useful? But the thing is that the LMS didn't know, know in software terms, that's what the students were doing. Learning design, it's the opposite. The whole structure is there and the machine knows it all the way through. So if you then are starting to collect data at every step of the process, feed that up into some kind of machine learning algorithm, you can give that algorithm the information that says, this is the flow of activities, this is what students should be doing. So the students who are getting things wrong, the students who are being very slow, students who are being too quick, all of that will stand out as being different from the bulk of the students going through. So there's your fundamental data to build a model that then allows you to make judgments about you know, who's within, what you'd expect, who's too, too well, who's not. So I think that's a really exciting bit about when lean design and AI come together, we can have a far more detailed model because we know what the model is in software at the very beginning. We're not deriving it you know, from what seems to me to be a, a, a pointless bit of learning, learning analytics on an LMS. There's one more I want to mention just quickly in terms of collaborative learning, and that is, and this is particularly to the TBL context, so for those of you who know it, I think you'll understand this quite quickly. No one, as far as I know, has ever brought together group-based learning and AI as a way of enhancing teaching directly. But there is a fantastic way you can do this with TBL. Think of the burning questions part of the TBL process. You have all these different groups of students. Some have got burning questions, some of them don't. Some of those student groups have demonstrated really high level understanding of certain topics, others are really struggling. Why not have the AI watching to see which groups are doing really well on certain topics, which groups are saying, I've got burning questions on those topics I really don't understand, and then match them together so that they do peer teaching of each other, but where the AI is helping to drive it. And what I find really interesting about that, the assumption there is not that the AI will do the magic teaching, it's actually peer teaching, it's fellow students who will teach each other, but the AI is watching for it to work out how do I match together the people who could best learn with each other. So that, as far as I know, has never been done before. I've never seen it described before, but everything is ready to do that today. So if those of you looking for new research projects and new opportunities, I reckon this would be fun. If it has been done before, please let me know because I'd be embarrassed to think I was making this up for the first time. But I think there's a really interesting opportunity there to bring together all the strength and power of TBL and learning design and AI and do something that's never done. Lastly, very quickly, one of the problems we have from a pedagogical point of view with AI is it's very hard for non-specialists to understand what it means. And where does it fit in my teaching? If I'm an average teacher, what do I do to say I talk too complicated? 
this again is where lean design can help us because in a sense, lean design has visualized the process of learning, you know, what steps the students will go through. So if you're then saying to an educator, say if you're an expert in AI or something, you're saying to them, okay, I think there's a particular point at which we could bring AI into your learning and it would add something to, to help people in this way. That way, AI is effectively a black box. The teacher doesn't need to know anything about what's happening in that box and its complexity and all the rest. All you're saying is that in the flow of activities, at this point, we could bring in something extra that would help the students. So, you know, as I say here, if you're thinking of it terms of branching, so that the educator doesn't need to know anything about AI other than it's going to help make the best pathway decision for students at that particular point. And if I'm the educator, I go, sure, great, I'll bring it on. I don't have to know about what the AI is doing. The person with the AI doesn't have to know about all the other activities. It sort of allows us to partition the different skill sets in a way that they can talk to each other more easily without having to know so much of each other. So I think that's it. So thank you. Any questions? I'll take one there and then one over there. Thank you for the interesting data. Um, some of it is an analogous to computer adaptive testing, where depending on the answer that the candidate students think, then the computer will select the next question. And for that, you need a lot of data on those questions. There are IoT data, feed parameter, whatever you've got in the system. Um, one issue that comes to mind with TBL is that you run a number of cases, you've got some questions, and then next year, the students if they've talked to people in the year above, will know the answer. The discussion that used to take an hour and now takes about five minutes when somebody goes, is AI no? That's the end of the conversation. Which means that you have to then generate new questions for this. Now, if you have new questions, then how are you going to feed that into your AI decision making? Because all that needs, it needs a lot of data in order to be able to guide the student or to match make, you know, do the matchmaking, because then you have to feed in new data, and with the new data you can't actually develop the algorithms. Makes sense? Yes, it does. So thank you. And that, I think that's absolutely true and a really significant problem that you, know, you don't want to lose the investment of all your work all the time. The problem isn't unique to this area, though. Like, even in traditional problem-based learning, I've watched you know, my old university, University of Sydney, develop PBL, had a fantastic year or two or three, and then within three years, the students all knew what the PBL problems were. They came in, had answers, and there was no useful discussion. So that's a, that's a broad problem with medical education, even beyond TBL or, or PBL. About the best advice I can give you is that when you design your cases, be it TBL or PBL, you want to look at them and say, OK, are there one or two parameters I can put within this case that I can change that would then allow me to vary it without very much effort, but could give me several years' worth of variation to it? So yeah, it could be that a certain key test comes out different ways from year to year, so you actually don't know which way it's going to go. That doesn't solve all the problems, but it at least would be one way of, at, at the early design stage, actually planning for the idea that students will get to know over time and then trying to work around it. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. And this question may be far too specific, but how many data points do you regularly need to uh, direct that student up to a certain branch? So how soon in a certain course can I use this system to manage the flow of my students? Um, potentially you can do very small amounts of data if you wish. So right now you can do a single quiz and you know if they get 9 or 10 out of 10 they go yeah. one branch otherwise they go another. So AI could be you've had three quizzes up to that point and you do some kind of calculation across all three quizzes to determine the branch. So that would be a very simple way you could do it that doesn't take a lot of work. But the really interesting one I think would be time on task. This system is tracking how much time every single student spends on every task. And then it has all the average data about the group. So you can have the AI asking questions like, what are their quiz scores and are they taking longer to do their tasks than their peers? If so, maybe they need more remediation. So that would be, you know, without a great deal of effort, that could help you. Now, if you then want to start to go even deeper, complex pathways, all the rest of it, yes, you can do that. And there's, you know, parts of traditional AI and education that look at that. But I think there's some pretty modest amounts of data that could actually be very helpful, like time on time. Thank you. Thank you so much.
We have the review of the field, we have the uh, tactical disposition to come into AI, what to think about. And we have actually the connection to learning design, which is by itself like an algorithm, right? But it's really well. The next is also a, uh, an issue that is often brought is how to then acquire data, I mean, from physical environment, from physical interaction, and is, yeah, so, so we have actually interesting. So I'd like to welcome in Victoria, who's going to talk about the uh, review of technologies for automated analysis of co locate real life physical learning environments. real-life learning scenarios. So the rationale behind our review is that we observe that most of the work on educational technologies is limited to structured computer-based environments where the entirety of interactions happen in the digital space. So basically the, the, the students take and sit in front of a computer, interact with an inter intelligent computer or web-based system. So this means that the learning task is often structured, many point and click, and they're collecting digital test responses. However, the majority of learning still occurs in face-to-face, co-located, real-life settings such as hands-on, project-based learning, collaborative learning, and traditional classrooms or even lecture styles such as this. And educational technologies that are employed in this kind of real-life learning scenarios are largely still fixated on collecting online portions of the curriculum, like I mentioned, point-and-click responses. Yeah. So the interactions that occur in the physical space of the learning um, classroom are rarely captured, much less modeled in the learning activities. So uh, to give an example, for example, in a face-to-face -face collaborative learning classroom, students will be discussing uh, to each other, they're sitting in a, in a group, however, the responses that we can capture using a learning management system is often really what they are, they are clicking. Is it option A, is it option B? How long do they take to respond? And the content of their team discourse, what they're actually saying to each other, how they're reacting to one another, these are the cues and um, information that often are not collecting. So um, as such, the learning, the learning analytics field has slowly evolved to kind of uh, accommodate a sub-view called physical learning analytics, as you can guess, is to create and deploy technologies to um, analyze uh, to analyze data uh, within physical classrooms. So we want, to, we want to analyze data in the physical sphere, such as speech, body movement, and biomarkers. So for this review, um, I, sh I shortlisted case studies that harness data from physical spaces, and after which they analyze the data using automated AI-driven methods, so such as machine learning algorithms, usually supervised. So um, a total of 66 case studies were selected and we categorized the studies according to from whom they collected data from, what kind of data did they collect, uh, what were the outcomes that they assessed, and what is the level of maturity of these technologies. So for this last um, category of level of, maturity, level of maturity, we look at at what scale was the technology deployed and what was the capability of the technology. So let me uh, go through some trends that we found from our reviews. Number one, we found that out of 66 studies that we selected, only uh, 41 studies collected data from students, and then 11 studies collected data from teachers, and the remaining 14 studies collected data from both teachers and students <coughs> at a classroom level. Secondly, the most common assessment outcome um, has to do with assessing student capability. So for example, student performance and student engagement. So from these two trends, we can see that most of the educational technologies that are developed for physical classrooms are set learner-centric, which is kind of the same trend that we see in education data learning and uh, online learning analytics. So the third trend that we uh, observe is that 40% of the studies that we reviewed leverage a combination of data modalities. So that means that they use uh, sometimes audios and a combination with video, and this combination was the most common. And the second most common combination of data modalities was using either audio or video, and then they combine with biomarkers such as EEG, heart rate, or eye tracking. 
So the last trend is that we noticed that most case studies tested their technology in rather small sample sizes. And this is no surprise as we noticed that the more complex a data collection setup became, the smaller sample size it could be deferred. So basically this is a, a, a problem, I guess, to overcome. Yeah. And so to give one example, one study that we found was that they tried to collect audio, video, eye tracking uh, data and accelerometer data from the teacher while the teacher was teaching. So because of this intensive data setup, they were only able to employ it on two teachers over 12 classroom sessions. And most of the case studies that we have reviewed, we found that they took place in non-Asian populations. So for our maturity analysis, we noted that a majority of our studies showcased the showcased success and capability of sensing and cap capturing physical data in a live, real-life classroom. Yeah, and they also showed that it's possible to automatically classify and cluster different types of learning activities and learning outcomes based on these types of data. However, only a quarter of the studies that we have reviewed went on to explain what is the significance of this result to plot generalizer, oh sorry, to plot visualizations of this data. And then um, when we look at how many studies actually went on using these results to give feedback or generate um, insights for interventions for teachers or students, we found that only two studies went on to do so. So the reality is that being able to automatically differentiate or classify learning activities and outcomes using physical data, it's still unclear how we can make it practical and useful for educators or students to act upon or reflect upon. So the other part, on the flip side of the equation, as I mentioned just now, there's a large focus on learner-centric educational technologies. So um, even though there's a set consensus and recognition that educational technology should be extended and created to help teacher reflection, uh, teacher assessment, and their professional development, in fact, we only found two studies that tangibly design interventions or visualization tools to help teachers to reflect upon the results that they collected in a live classroom session. So taken uh, in general, um, I feel, even though there was a lot of, there was a lot of things, a lot of trends that didn't seem very good, I feel that the progress in the physical learning analytics field is rather promising. Because for a system, for an automated system to be able to generate feedback, then generate insights of what kind of interventions you can uh, implement on students and teachers, you have to be able to overcome collecting data in a realistic, noisy like classroom. Because first, your, your learning tasks are no longer structured. Your students are now no longer looking at people that are interacting with each other, they're interacting with your teachers. Many things kind of come from that. It's complex. And most of the case studies that we have reviewed have shown that it is, uh, have shown success that it is possible to send and capture this kind of data. However, these tools, as of now, lack a certain degree of reliability and interpretability for it to give tangible outcomes to help educators and students. So let me end off my presentation with a few suggestions for future directions. So firstly, as more and more classrooms adopt blended learning models, the incorporation of digital devices that capture online portions of the curriculum should be integrated and, and synchronized with physical data collection setups. Secondly, going back to the point about small sample sizes, apart from trying to develop more sophisticated, uh, more sophisticated data analytics methods, there should be more work directed to developing practical and easily deployable data collection setups so that they can be easily put in and integrated into a live classroom <coughs> session without disrupting the classroom session itself. And then lastly, there's a need for more research to develop more generalizable models. So there's a need to set up maybe more inclusive data corpus to support transnational collaborations and cross-cultural cross validation. Any questions? <coughs> I have a question, which I find interesting because you are from the Nova School of NTU and you do actually research on medical education complex. 
So where are you in, in terms of that kind of work in, in the medical education context? I mean, have you, uh, from, based on this review, are you doing some work, actually some projects in relation to this? From background, I'm actually from the School of Triple E, so Electrical and Electronic Engineering, but I'm trained in psychology. So, yeah. uh, basically, our lab is the world's the world, we are working with LKC Medicine um, to collect data, so audio and video recordings of students while they are in team based learning classrooms. <coughs> what I want to see is that we are we able to look at, uh, to use audio and video recordings to understand how team dynamics, the team dynamics during team based learning. <coughs> To use audio and video recordings to understand how team dynamics actually contribute to collaborative learning. Because we know that team-based learning is a, it's a good learning paradigm to use. But a lot of times we are unable to capture what are the students speaking to each other during their interactions. So what makes a team good? What makes a team good? What makes a team, makes a team, makes a team bad? So are we able to use audio and video recordings to, to differentiate between these two types, these two types of teams? Victoria. And now we have uh, another section which is going to then lift you up to another uh, level which is actually uh, aimed at providing three perspectives and uh, the first one is Nancy, I'm happy that you're here, from, also from Singapore, yeah, in the US. We are going to talk about higher education in the era on the fourth, of the fourth industrial revolution. Yes. And I will actually ask you to literally lift you up since you've been sitting for 40 minutes. If you'd like to stand for a minute, shake out your legs. You're still human for now. Sorry, I'm, I forgot to say this is the well-being session by yes, Nancy. Well -being. <laughs> so it's not good for us to sit for 40 minutes. So read the sky, whatever. Um, yeah, okay. I, I can stand still and talk, so I will not use the microphone, but I will yell. I'm kind of American, sorry. Okay, I, 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 I will. So, um, okay, I'm going to Yale. So, um, I'm Nancy Gleason. I'm at Yale and U.S. College here in Singapore. It's a four-year undergraduate at the Arts College, um, and I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning there. So, my job is to train the faculty in how to teach interdisciplinarily um, and how to get at what we call higher-order thinking. Um, and, and in terms of Med Ed and AI, what I actually focus on is what's called the fourth industrial revolution. So even though we don't have tech that I was thinking might be here, I'm just gonna do the one finger, two finger tech. So one finger on your chest, if you think you know what the fourth industrial revolution is, and two fingers on your shoulder, or whatever, if you don't know what it is. One is yes, two is no. If you could just clicker on your own shoulder, okay, so I get a sense of your prior knowledge, which we all do with good pedagogy some no voters, okay. All right, it's pretty mixed between ones and twos. But the good news is you can download my book for free. So you can Google download my book. I'm going for a quarter of a million downloads, so please do download it, it is free. Um, I, I tried to do 10 slides in 10 minutes, which means that I deleted the agenda slide to tell you what we're gonna talk about today. So I apologize that you're on this journey with no map. But um, the fourth industrial revolution, given about half of you had ones, but also I can lie and pretend you all had ones and twos, because I have this slide here no matter what your answer was. Um, but you know, we've had three previous industrial revolutions. The short version of that story is that these three were about the automation of physical production. And they freed up human capacity to create more production. This one is different. This is about the automation of cognition. This is about the automation of knowledge. It's also happening at a much faster pace. I heard someone at one of my tables earlier today talking about the British spinning jennies going away in the first industrial revolution, but they were very worried about the jobs going away. And indeed, there is going to be technological unemployment. Doctors, nurses, and everybody in the medical field will not be um, protected from that. Uh, so one of the things I'm gonna talk about is also how you as adults need to upskill, what you're asking your students to learn and think in different ways. But indeed, this is the fourth industrial revolution. It's happening now because we have cloud computing, which enables artificial intelligence to process large pieces of data. We knew that from sort of sci-fi 
that this was possible, but we didn't have, but we were missing the piece we're missing was cloud computing. We have that now, so we're here. There are skills you need in this economy that you have not needed in the previous industrial revolution economies. The education we have delivered and the skills employers have demand were based on a manufacturing economy. That is going away. And so this is World Economic Forum data. There's lots of different lists. I might see if my sources are cut off. I promise this, there are citations in the slides. If you get a copy. Um, the, and the main thing that goes away here is active listening. No one was doing it anyway. But the idea being now you can record it. And quality control. So if your job involves pattern-based quality control, it's not going to be needed for you to do it anymore. It does not mean you're going to get fired. It means the tasks you do under your job description will change. This is the same for medicine as it is for fast food. You know those jobs are going away. As it is for you know some other industries. But complex problem solving is still the number one thing employers want. And we want this in medicine. We want people to be able to think across fields to find solutions. To say, OK, I've got this, this complex history. OK, their brother smoked, but they didn't. But OK, so I don't know what that means. But something with the lungs, I'm assuming. So I'm a political scientist. So these are there's a shift in what we need people to do. And this means we have to shift how we teach and how we look at the same types of data as doctors or dentists or people in the medical field. So maybe if, as if some of you are educators, you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy of higher order thinking. Medicine, like everybody else, was learn the stuff, understand it, and regurgitate it on a test. You very rarely got to the upper levels of the rainbow. Um, the other version of this you may be familiar with if you're into education science is Sobo's taxonomy, which is similar to this. Um, and, and we want people to be able to differentiate different practices when you would use them uh, in the humanities, whatever, different, different philosophical approaches, why and how you use them. So these verbs become things that we start to assess in tests. Uh, perhaps in the medical industry, this would be multiple choice tests. Um, but you know, how are you critiquing something? What are, how are you weighing the different things you know? And then at the end, you do an honors thesis, a master's thesis, a PhD dissertation, and you defend it. And that shows that you know how to position yourself in the literature and create new knowledge. Okay? Pedagogically, how do we get at this? We use project-based learning, whether that's uh, um, uh, based on your discipline, what types of, you know, in this case, it would be simulation, where you're actually doing the authentic work um, on, sample, on sample patients. Right? Authentic experiences, this with medicine is when you go to your residency. Um, or, and teamwork, right? If you are doing something that does not involve a team, a robot can do it. Only team-based work will remain for humans. Okay? I don't know when this transition is going to happen. McKinsey says, fully complete by 2050. Uh, but you also need to be able to do self-regulated research. You have to be able to think independently without that team. So that's a, a contradiction in, in the, the skills that are needed. But when we're teaching, we want to get at this higher order thinking. If we just do information transfer like I'm doing now, you'll forget it. So Bloom actually, so this was that one I just showed you. But Bloom actually had a second dimension, which he called the knowledge dimension, which is about metacognition, knowing what we know. And this is where I think all medical uh, education professions have to change what they're doing in the classroom. You have to talk to students, adult learners, and people who are pre-professional about what they know and what they don't know. Because in the what we would call the gig economy, this is going to happen in medicine as well, you will jump from employer to employer. And you're going to have to know how to do what we call tribe. Old people call it networking. Young people call it tribing. But you have to know what you do and don't know so you know who to network with. You have to know, OK, I don't know enough about AI to know that this machine's wrong, but I feel this machine's wrong. You have to have someone in your network, someone in your tribe who can answer that question for you. That may be inside your hospital. That may be at the uh, LaSalle Art School down the street, someone who's more creative than you are. I don't know. Some kind of different skill that you need to tap. It's a cognitive skill, not surgery versus dentistry. Those are cognitive skills as well, but you know. So you want to know your own biases and deconstruct them. This gets more and more important in a post-truth world where we, we, we 
um, fall back on our own implicit biases to know what we know. Right? My country is riddled with this problem right now. <laughs> Um, and you want to reflect on your own progress, and eventually you want to create an innovation and learning. Right? And so th th this you can apply to any of your own programs. The red, the red doesn't change, but the blue you just put in your own discipline. You can take these puzzle pieces out and design this for yourself, and then say, over the six years I have time with the medical student, when am I letting them, when am I introducing these different levels of thinking, when am I letting them practice it, and when am I requiring them to demonstrate it? And that's how you change the weight of the assessment. So, I saw someone already use this picture, so I think I probably did steal this from IBM. Without deciding <laughs> the image, yeah. I just did medicine and thinking, and this came up. So, there are some things that are also changing. So, the fourth industrial revolution is not just AI. It's about eight different technologies. 3D printing, drones, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, two minutes, and um, some other things. They all, on their own, do something, but together they're changing the way we work and live. Together they're changing how long humans live. Together they're going to change how long you have to work. Right? So we're talking here about bringing millennials and Gen Cs into the medical field, but a lot of your colleagues are going to come back into the classroom. You guys are going to come back into the classroom. Because there's a different way of thinking that has to happen to affect and practice medicine. So digital literacy and medical education, right? all of a sudden, being able to use a tablet is essential. And not all medical professionals know how to do that. The Gen Zs do, and they will demand it of you in the classroom. So uh, virtu uh, virtual dissection, you have to I don't know. I can't even, I saw that one. That sounds very complicated to me. Um, curated online information, this goes back to knowing what is truth, knowing how we know we know, information literacy. It's not just research skills. Um, augmented reality and, and virtual reality, certainly <coughs> new stages in where which we will learn with the practice crisis environment. So Personalized genomics, and I'm going to come back to this one because this has huge ethical implications. Um, and then the medical decision reports. You have to have, this isn't a cheesy <coughs> phrase, but your robot intelligence quotients. When is the algorithm steering you wrong? When is the artificial intelligence steering you wrong? And I didn't know exactly what that meant. I'd read about it until I realized that, that my Apple Music that I put on, I always let it pick the music for me. And it sends me different things. And it can be bluegrass one day, or jazz, or K-pop, or whatever. The backbeat is always the same. Because the algorithm, I had to do some, like, pick your top 10 artists when I first signed up for the app. I picked those artists, and it made a backbeat to that. And so it does not matter what I genre I listen to, it all sounds the same to me. And I realized the algorithm was steering me wrong, because the whole reason I was letting you pick me music was to give me something I wouldn't pick myself. So the algorithm got me wrong. You have to have that knowledge of how algorithms work, and when you bump up against something that doesn't feel right, you've got to go with it. So medical decision reports are going to be something people need a lot of training. Um, and then telemedics. This is sort of uh, this company does um, Uber for healthcare with nurses, right? So this whole new industries that are going to pop up. My prediction is the two biggest places to make a billion dollars and around in there is in health and is in education. And the combination, a couple trillion, right? So you just call me when you have an idea, and we'll see what we can do. So far, I'm still making faculty solid. Um, so there, there is good news, right? There's, there's positive things that AI can do with healthcare, more efficient, gets rid of human bias. I don't agree with that one, but I won't keep writing it. We're still putting in the information. But help patients manage symptoms and cope with chronic illness at home, and hopefully avoid some types of bias and errors, although we'll, we'll have new ones. Um, but students have to be trained to recognize the ethical issues um, when they arise in their practice, and they have to have a systematic way to handle those. Because if you make the decision in the moment, then it's on your own ethics. You have to know the values and systems of your hospital and the values and systems of your patients. And those might not align. Um, so this is something to think about. So um, th these are some of the ethical issues that come back. And so um, my current book project is called The Cognition Gap. 50% of that is on ethics. But it's really particularly important in the medical space. What are the ethical challenges you're going to face? Erroneous decisions by AI. How are you going to handle that? Lawsuits against your hospital for erroneous decisions by AI. Are you going to pay out or are you going to take it to court? Um, 
risk of inherent bias in the data of AI. This is actually probably the biggest one in all the fields related to AI right now. Um, um, uh, potential for AI to be used for malicious purposes, right? We're not even malicious, but we're getting very close to, if we aren't already there in your own hospitals, picking what our babies look like, right? And, and, and where is the ethical space for that, right? And in medicine, we already had a big problem with this when we created the, um, the uh, movable sonogram machines, which when, when they transferred out of the culture that created them, they're used to abort female fetuses, right? So there's different, you, it might not be malicious, but the application ends up not being your intention. So thinking about what externalities some of the things you create happen and forcing your students to think about those as well in the classroom. Uh, is, is a new space for ethical teaching. It's not, the, it's not the stuff it used to be, which is still important. We have to add on top of it. Um, as adult learners ourselves, it's time to go back to school. I don't know when the last time you went to school, but it's time to not go to a lecture, go take a course. They are free. If you're Singaporean, they're definitely free. But LinkedIn has hour-long courses that you can just program to pop up on your phone right when you would be going into bed and scrolling video. So, uh, get a badge, get a certificate, try a MOOC, doesn't matter if you drop out, but if we're encouraging lifelong learners, I know you guys all have to upskill and redo your cred credentials regularly, but learn something outside of medicine to make you a better medical practitioner. Okay? Um, and mentoring is key, and this means letting our ego go a little bit outside the door and let younger people mentor up as much as older people mentor down. They are not ready for a corner office and their own personal assistant. They know how to use technology better than most of us here in the room. <coughs> so we have to let them man mentor us up while we are mentoring them down. And I'm going to wrap up by just reminding you that if you focus only on AI and you lose focus on the demographics, the climate change, and the gender challenges, one of the other ones will hit you in the head. Um, and that's it. So. Oh, question. <coughs> yes. I think that's a very popular presentation. Uh, and I'm really glad that you brought up the sort of the impact issues. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of data ownership. Because the first time we've all this big data uh, companies out there that are going to be able to make you know, business and progress out of data and possible data and individuals. So, how should we handle it? Uh, I mean, this is why you have to define your values. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way, but being up front in the beginning, you know, it's going to be used. It's going to be used. If there's data, it's going to be used. So if it's if, if you choose to do nothing, then probably it will be nefarious. So as a hospital, as leaders of teams, if you can make your own path there, that's great. I mean, you have things like that you kind of go and do no harm, but, but there are, what, what, Things like, well, once we have real cyber-physical systems, and, and you have augmented humans uh, in your hospital who live for 110 years, there are gonna be different types of issues that we can't anticipate. Uh, and there may be new moral uh, vocabulary we come up with to discuss these issues. But I think keeping them alive, if you've never taken a philosophy class, go back to school and take a book on philosophy. Right? How have people grappled with these technologies in the previous three industrial revolutions? This one's different, but there's always been a moral element, particularly in medicine. So how has it been grappled with in the past? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. But we do need to make some standard um, pillars to lean against. Um, but maybe even regular brainstorm, as the technology will change so fast. Yes, and yes. Just, just to add to the point, it's, it's a, maybe a strange uh, purple, but in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19, information, they put information in there as a, as a basic human right. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression. This right of free flow of opinions without interference and secrecy of part information that you surround any media or regardless of the media. This was written in the day, and this is still very valid. It's valuable. We have a terrible time of using that. Sorry. I have a bad question. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. 
<laughs> so I'm sorry. I think this is getting me. The, the more topics that comes in, the more questions you have in your head, <laughs> and the more frustrating it is uh, with the limitation of time. But hopefully, you can bring on that discussion to uh, to uh, the end of the day and to tomorrow. So I'd like to ask Paul to take over now. Uh, you are going to talk about the rise of artificial intelligence in and its implication on educational systems and practices. Okay, so I have 10 minutes, and, and this is going to be what I imagine speed dating must be like. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go through these slides very quickly. I'm not going to elaborate. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to provide you a helicopter view of the timeline development with respect to AI. I'm going to give you some what I think are working definitions around these terms AI, machine learning, and deep learning. And I'm going to suggest some applications that uh, I've discovered, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ethics and values of um, folks that have come along. So here are the key things that Frank Rosenblatt early on in the 50s does, uh, does develop the idea of the perceptron, which is a reflection of the neuron, the brain. So he tried to do that. He created one network. So he could feed the images in tell them apart. But then there was really not much happening until Jeffrey Hinton, who is the sort of the godfather, the grandfather of the whole development of deep learning, came along. And so you see Rosenblatt developed that, Jeffrey Hinton developed that, and in the 80s a self-driving car was built by this man named Dean Armour. Then nothing much until Jan Lagoon came along, and that's when he started to translate uh, handwritten digits. <coughs> so that, that was a, a big breakthrough. Then again, in 2006, we had the super fast chips arriving, and, then, and that was when we could then start to identify images. And when I came in, the picture was about 2012, and that's when the supercomputers started to arrive that could support the software algorithms. So that's a bit of a, a brief overview of it, given the timeline. So what is AI, machine learning, and deep learning? We'll start with AI, collection of techniques Basically, you've heard of other definitions which cleverly apply math to create a semblance of intelligence. We need to come back to that later on. So there's narrow AI, that's Cortana, that's Alexi, that's OK Google. And then there's general AI, which is an attempt to move towards what uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about referencing uh, Ray Kurzweil later on, the uh, singularity where the computer becomes sentient. I'm not going to say it's going to be sending, I'm saying it's going to be a rational, autonomous agency. Machine learning. What is machine learning? So to help you figure this out, think of a car. Okay, that's AI. The engine is machine learning. Deep learning will be the size of the engine. So the subset of algorithms trained to do a task on a known data, then churn through the data to find patterns and make predictions. So we have supervised, labeled data. In other words, I ask, I give the answer. Right? Then we have unsupervised, unlabeled data. There's no answer given by us. The machine gives us the answer. And then we have reinforcement feedback given. We don't say that it's the best answer. We say it's a good answer, but it's not the best. The machine is finding the best answer. Deep learning. This is where we get into the multi-layered neural networks, which have, we have the input, we have the black box information going on, and then we have the output. We're having trouble understanding what's going on in there, and the illusions that you've made uh, are support that. So what is deep learning pretty good at? It's great at speech recognition and computer vision, especially now this, the, the self-driving cars. What are the behaviors of AI? All right. It uses rules to reach conclusions. It can do planning, it can do calendaring, it can learn and acquire knowledge, it can do knowledge representation, it can perception, it can learn self-correct, it can manipulate, we're seeing a lot of that. It can solve and make predictions. It can um, do motion. Car, self-driving cars are, are you know, evidence of that. Now, this last one, social intelligence and creativity. This is an area where we think there's going to be a lot of stuff going on, but we have to be a little bit careful. The social intelligence, if you look at what's going on in China with uh, you know, social uh, measurements, is a, a, it, you know, if, if you are um, responding properly in your WhatsApp and you're doing your Facebook properly, hey, your, your social metric is going to rise. And, and so 
perspective. That's an area that I'm uncomfortable with. So back in 57, a man named Norbert Weiner said, to put a purpose into a machine, you better be absolutely certain what the purpose is that you desire. And I'm coming back to this now. So what are these evolving general applications? So we know this is where it's very, very effective. This is where it's very, very dangerous in terms of personal liberty, I think. Then recommend what you should find next online. We have all these algorithms working. We've got a new use of that with, the, with the, the Apple playlist, etc. Spot, spam, <coughs> or credit card, fraud. Understand what you say. So we've all had to play around with Siri and we played with OK Google and got all those nonsense responses. Applications in medicine. So delivery of medical services in a world where doctor shortages exist, something like 200,000 is the number that I've uh, most recently come across. All this is in the references. If you download this presentation, all the references are there. You're welcome to use them. Um, recognize what is in an image and a video speedier. So this identification and assistive prediction is already been talked about here. Biometrics, real-time tracking for diagnosis and management of chronic diseases. That's happening. Uh, hospital and pharmacy robotics eliminates the possibility of human error. There are trials already happening in which this is no longer a problem in the hospital. And then elder care, robots can then detect and interpret signals in the brain. I just read an article, uh, uh, I have this paper called AI Daily, and I fed these articles, and you can, you can follow that. Three people communicated with the electromagnetic uh, impulses. Three. Careful on that one. Um, what are some of the juices in MedEd? Dynamically generated student learning profiles. This is a little bit built a little bit on what James was talking about. So I know what the students are doing, how long, etc. Personalized and adaptive. Uh, knowledge review by quizzes, cases or problems. Targeted content, just in time, and meaningful feedback. So these are some of the things, generalized applications. So what memory? Okay, this one here. There's a 50% chance of AI outperforming humans in all tasks within 45 years, and automating all human jobs in, in 120 years. Think about that. Here are some of the things that's gonna happen. By 2024, translating languages. It's gonna write high school essays. In fact, I think it's sometimes writing newspaper articles. Right, <laughs> 2027, Truck drivers no longer run. Working in retail, 2031. Writing a best-selling book, 2049. Working as a surgeon, 2053. Upskill. To what? Okay, yeah. let me come back. I want to reference now some of the people that have really I've caught my attention back when I started looking at this. Okay, you can think whatever you like about Elon Musk, but a guy who puts a rocket up into space and brings it down and lands it on a platform in the ocean, sure as hell knows what he's talking about. He is afraid and seriously worried. Stuart Russell is a professor of computer science who spent a whole lifetime in this area. He is now saying to this, our systems must do what we want them to do. And he is now saying to, he's, he's saying to them, look, you're afraid to say something because your funding is dependent on your continuing to explore this. So if you say that we have a, we need to pay attention, your funding may be affected. So I'm not saying anything. If there's any book that I encourage you to read this year, read The Rise of Robots. It's wiping out the middle class. AI will wipe out the middle class. So what and who are, who's gonna buy the goods? I mean, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that. Here, Nick Boston. This guy caught my attention in 2012. This is about well, the same time as I read Great Kurzweil's Singularity is New. And what Kurzweil is saying is that, well, you know, we're off uh, the soup, the computer will become super intelligent. And Bostrom is saying, when the singularity occurs, it's not gonna be like, oh, hey, did you know that the singularity happened yesterday? By that time, the, the intelligence is one mile, a hundred miles ahead of us. We'll never catch it because we don't have brain power. Sam Harris, cognitive neuroscientist, is saying he's lying awake at night thinking about this, so am I. Yuval Harari, who's talking about, and he has written Homo Deus, 
and um, Sapiens, the rise of uh, whatever, I forget now. All these books are, to, you know, erase the practical advantage of democracy if you are in communist China. This is great, but it's not great in a democracy. So you're talking about democratization of education, but you know, we need to consider that. Peter Haas, I, I picked him up because he talked about bias, bias in forming decisions about, uh, because the bias is inherent in the programmers. They are programming. So the base that you talked about, right? if that doesn't get tweaked over 10 years, we don't know why it, it's happening, but that's what you get. So how are you going to go back and deal with it? So I can encourage you to think about that. Now, for the positives, Ray Kurzweil, AI will enhance human capability. I like that because if I can upload my consciousness into a robotic body, I'm signing up. Jeffrey Hinton, he's also saying, machines will get smarter than people. No, Joshua Bengio, who is also a, a student of Jeffrey Hinton, and is a, a significant researcher in deep learning, has said, technology cannot run amok. Okay. I agree. Max Tegmark, MIT AI researcher, don't believe in carbon chauvinism. Think about that. He's saying we're carbon chauvinists. Silicon chauvinism is on the roadway. Okay. These are people that are actually you know, talking about this in a significant way, and they're having an impact. Andrew, of um, course, there are great. AI can open education to all. It can. I think that's a very positive thing because we need to get the youngest minds in the world focus on the issues that we face. Chris Bishop, another Microsoft computer science professor in a couple of big universities, we should be celebrating AI and what it will bring. I agree. Now, imagine Sophia having access to all databases and linked just to this robot, Atlas, who can do parkour. You know what parkour is? Does everybody know what parkour is? This guy can do that. This is the eighth generation of this. Okay? Common sense is the dark matter of called artificial intelligence. On the imperative now for the control and transmission of ethics and values, which you've talked about. Consonant with principles endemic to Homo sapiens sapiens. So this site, Asalamar, a number of uh, AI folks, <coughs> Tegmar, Kurzweil, Art uh, Hinton, they've all gone to the site. I've signed up. I encourage you to do this because this is about preserving our humanity. <laughs> this one is beautiful. Some cases still remain difficult to users to know why and why. Okay. Uh, this is just the part off the press, off forums. A few memorable examples include a Microsoft chatbot on Rogue. We all know about that one. Wikipedia edit engaging in feuds. Edit bots in Wikipedia engaging in feuds. Think about that. And Uber self driving cars ignoring red lights. Okay, I don't. No, I don't. And Russian robot, Promobot IR77, escaping the laboratory. Hello. <laughs> okay. Okay, my time's up. Here's the references. Thank you. We need time to digest this. <laughs> I, I want to finish with this. I have time. I am passionate about the potential. Okay. I really am. I'm excited about the way in which it can transform medical education and medical health. I'm vigilant. Thank you, thank you Paul. Uh, um, next is Melvin, and uh, he will be talking about medical artificial intelligence. Uh, I, get, I get a sense you are going to screw up the heat a bit more. <laughs> Hopefully, you see if they can cope with it, but uh, the, the floor is yours. I, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll go over time a bit. I hope you are okay with that, but we uh, finish up uh, with, uh, uh, so you are given a full 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nadeo, for the introduction.
So I'll round up the, the talk so uh, my presentation on medical AI and the causality deficit. But before I begin, um, I think Kai Singh um, is the presenter to know me all a bit of the history about the term artificial intelligence. I would say in fact that AI is a term that I'll use with extreme caution. It's a placeholder for something indeterminate. In fact, uh, you find that John McCarthy introduced the term uh, following his uh, uh, organization of the summer workshop at Dartmouth College. I right, to differentiate that area of research, AI from research on automata, also on cybernetic studies. But at this point in time, you're not sure, quite sure what intelligence is. Right? So whatever we are looking to use, I mean, when we use artificial to modify, we're not quite sure what we're modifying. So it's an open question. You find that there are some pioneers in AI research, likes of um, uh, Robert Simon, uh, Newell as well. They prefer another term. Right? For many years, they continue to use the term uh, complex information processing. So that's just to throw a bit of a span in the works, given that we've uh, abused uh, this uh, term AI. <laughs> and to set the scene a bit further, I've got my collaborator uh, over here in attendance, uh, Associate Professor Chu Lok from the Physics uh, Department. So you find that uh, this is part of our current uh, collaborative and interdisciplinary research project on addressing what we term the causality deficit in medical AI research. Our longer, our longer term goal is to address what we term the care deficit in medical AI. So the first bit uh, has a direct relation to medical diagnostic programs. The second would have, I think, a, a deeper relation with care boards. And anything in, in, health, in the healthcare industry that requires uh, this, this uh, uh, concept of care. So I've listed our research interests as well. You are free to check out our academic profiles at your leisure on NTU. Okay, so briefly, and this is really just to um, uh, raise what, what uh, Paul has gone through far, far uh, deeper sense, but just to, to set the scene a bit uh, more. You find machine learning based uh, artificial intelligence uses algorithms very broadly to learn from statistical data. What I'll stress from the outset is that the st statistical data is restricted to the actual world in which we live. Right? So in, in philosophy, you know that using your ad sign. And, and you find that the patterns are recognized, they are spotted, and from the recognition of patterns, find that machine learning based AI will then proceed to make informed decisions. It will try to make recommendations. And some examples of machine learning based uh, medical AI diagnostic systems. So the very first, the, the, uh, the Pioneer Expert System, right, developed at Stanford University, Mycin. Uh, IBM Watson, which uh, I think it, its first claim to fame would have been uh, in defeating human competitors in jeopardy in 2011. It's since been used as a medical diagnostic program. But we'll see a bit more about the fate of IBM Watson as we go along. At least what I anticipate will be the eventual fate of IBM Watson, given it's what I think to be its fatal flaw. Right, you have as well Microsoft's inner eye. So whereas um, Stanford's Mycin and IBM Watson, they, they, they deal with uh, uh, NLP, natural language processing, you find that Microsoft's inner eye has been developed um, as, a, as, a, as a visual diagnostic program. And it, it, it deals with visual processing. Given certain radiological images, it can determine whether or not we are looking at an image of a tumor or a healthy, a healthy anatomy. And what is at issue with machine learning based AI? What is at issue with the data driven approach? As I, I've tried to suggest from the outset, when you use a machine learning based approach, it is a statistical approach. Right? The best exemplars we have of reasoning are human beings. And you find that we are, very, we are very poor statistical reasoning machines. On the other hand, however, we are powerful causal reasoning machines. Children from the age of two years, three years are able to employ various powers of causal reasoning, including the use of counterfactuals, right? dealing with antecedents that are counter to fact. And at this point in time, given how machine learning is used as a technique, you find that programs and machines are constrained by the real, by the actual, they are able to imagine other possible alternative scenarios. And because of that, you find um, th how they go about making their predictions and decisions will be quite different from how we as human beings reason in, term of, in terms of counterfactuals, in terms of interventions, in terms of looking at uh, correlations in the data. So a few problems uh, that Lokir and I have identified. The first, the problem of correlation versus uh, causation. So, so this is quite a hackneyed point. But as you should be aware, correlation is a good guide to causation, but no guarantee of it. And why is that the case? You might have hidden common causes. Right? You find that you would have to condition on common causes, but if you look at statistical data, if you're looking to spot patterns, normally you're dealing with 
uh, what is called marginal dependence relations, right, between two variables. You would normally have to condition on a further variable before you get what you're looking for, right, which would be conditional dependence relations. So uh, as has been pointed out in Thomas Reed, right, key figure in the Scottish Enlightenment tradition, day follows the night and night the day, but one is not the cause of the other. And why is that? We have built, I mean, if you just consider the first bit of passage, to condition on the common cause, which is the rotation on the, of the Earth on its axis. Right, so that, that bit is left out if you are proceeding strictly by a correlative or statistical approach. The second bit is hype versus reality. Right, I understand the hype in the, the, the tech industry, and why is that? Because that's how you open the floodgates for funding. But the problem is sometimes the hype does not measure up to the reality. So if we critically examine IBM Watson, right, there's been a, a whole slew of concordance studies that, that have, have been uh, put in place. So you find that the concordance rate is pretty decent if you look at the tumor board in India, right? looking at uh, concordance rates uh, in the 90s. But if you adopt a more cross-cultural perspective, right, if you look at concordance rates with a tumor board in South Korea, you're looking at as low as 43% for gastric cancer recommendations. And why is that the case? Right, you find that how IBM Watson has been trained is in a very restricted, limited capacity. Right, it involves the adoption of certain US or American-centric assumptions. and involves also uh, training with a very limited set of physicians from a particular can cancer center in the United States. So that, that results in a certain limitation in how IBM Watson can make its uh, predictions and its diagnosis. The third problem is a problem in the AI research tradition known as distributional shift. Right? You can train your AI machine, your program, as much as you want. And to the extent that the training distribution is identical to or similar to the test distribution, right? you find that your machine learning based AI will get it right. But once you make that shift in your test distribution, you find that machine learning based AI will get it catastrophically wrong. Right, the paper I can recommend for, for you to read at your leisure is it's The Elephant in the Room, recently published by a bunch of uh, researchers from York University. So the idea is that you have machine learning based AI that can recognize images, that, that has been trained to recognize images. But once you introduce a visual anomaly, right, and in the case of the, 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 the Elephant in the Room uh, research article, they, they place a small image of an elephant by right, the set of the image. Right, then you find these expert systems get the recognition drastically wrong. Right? They start misidentifying objects in the room that they've been trained to recognize in the past. Okay, so this is the problem of distributional shift. When we are dealing with test situations that are novel, that are unexpected. Right? We as human beings are flexible and adaptable, but you find that machine based uh, machine learning based systems are not. Right? So so something that you might want to read up a bit more if you're keen as well, transfer learning, which I, I think in fact will be what will ultimately unlock right, uh, any possible solution to the, the distributional shift problem. And what is one possible response? Right? If you've been uh, partly schooled in the machine learning tradition, in the deep learning tradition, you might say, let's just go for more data. Where the data I, I had was biased, was not sufficiently representative, let's try and do some cleaning up of the data, right? make, it, make it larger. I find there will be two, I think, uh, lessons right, that, 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 that we can trace from history. The first, the history of the AI. The second, the history of civilization. Right, you find that, that there is a lesson from perceptrons, and this comes from a legend of one of connectionism's uh, very first applications. Right, as Paul has astutely pointed out, right, this is indeed Frank Rosenblatt's heritage, right, the perceptron. So there was a perceptron that was used by the United States military to try and distinguish between images where you have army tanks and stones in the woods, and the woods without the tanks. So you find that with the training distribution, the machine learning based AI was able to get it right, right, the perceptron, to make the relevant distinctions. But then give the new, the novel test distributions and misrecognition started happening, right, things started going awry. So the, the military researchers were scratching their heads and they realized, in fact, that the pictures in which you had the tanks were taken on a sunny day. Whereas the pictures without the tanks, right, pictures just with the woods were taken on cloudy days. So what the machine learning based AI had, had been trained therefore to recognize would be the distinction between sunny days and cloudy days, which would not have been the original intention of the of the of the AI researchers themselves. Okay, couple minutes. Alright, so a couple minutes our first quick, quick run through of the history of science. Okay, so so Stephen Fulman, right, uh, an esteemed philosopher makes this distinction between Greek and Babylonian science. 
So very briefly, Babylonian science relies on a model blind approach. Right? Statistical black box predictions, you find that the Babylonians kept astronomical diaries and using their diaries they were able to make pretty good predictions about the orbits of certain planetary bodies. On the other hand, the Greeks tried to construct models of reality, models that would approximate reality. Here you have an image of Hipparchus, right? the Greek uh, uh, astronomer in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his observatory in Alexandria, and he is the founder of trigonometry. Right, so using the model of trigonometry and also certain solar and lunar th theories, he was able to predict right, solar eclipses. So what you find therefore is that if you adopt a machine learning based AI approach, it is analogous to the Babylonian approach. Right? It's model blind. But then you find that how science has developed over time, uh, really the I think the, the battle between the Greeks and the Babylonians right, would have been won by the Greeks, right? Using a model based approach. So we, we do need a principal approach to distinguish between spurious accidental correlations and causal correlations, that's the first bit. And what Longer and I recommend is that we adopt a causal modeling approach. So given the constraints of time, I'm unable to talk a bit more about this causal modeling approach. But Judea Pearl, if any of you are schooled in, in, in computer science and are aware of this uh, structural causal modeling approach, his SCM approach, that I believe is the way forward, he's published this year, a paper entitled Theoretical Impediments to Machine Learning. So we suspect, I mean, Logan and I, that if we try to um, use this approach and and try and blend it in with, with excellent approaches, that we'll get a bit closer to what we're looking for. Right, so this quick uh, uh, quick word on the fate of IBM Watson. This year, IBM has held a workshop on causality for healthcare, so they probably realized that they've got to double back a bit and just reject the whole thing. <laughs> Next step for us would be first to design a mini Turing test for causal reasoning, and then we try and construct a formal algorithm that will allow um, our system to pass the mini Turing test for causal reasoning. And this will be a way station right, for the eventual development of the blueprint for an AI system capable of reasoning in terms of counterfactuals. And after that, we look to address the care deficit. Is, uh, apologies for. <laughs> The, the volume of information, but any questions you might have about causality deficit or care deficit, or here is also an uh, attendance will be able to do rather questions. Um, do you see application for the care deficit outside of medical patients? Is it, that, that's a very good question. So whatever we, we are discussing here, the causality and the care deficit, we believe with, I think with, with due recognition to the context that you're referring to, there will be that uh, possible uh, possibility of generalization. Right? I mean, with, with causal reasoning machines, I can imagine a whole slew of sectors, apart from the medical sector, where you would find some pushes. Likewise for the care deficit. But we, we, we identified the care deficit because we feel that care boards, as they stand in the industry, are insufficient. Right? They work, but you find that they tend to have a certain normality factor. Care boards wear out after a certain uh, period of time. Why? Because they have a very limited repertoire of responses. We find in addition that we as human beings, and here I speak as a philosopher, have a moral duty to see the world as it is. And many times you find these patients in palliative care, they tend to anthropomorphize. Right? They start treating care bots, right? I mean, so these eyeballs, for example, various other care bots, and as if they were human beings. And that involves a certain level of willful self deception that we would have to uh, recognize as well. Well, I would like to thank you, everyone. I think the goal of this session was to get you near uh, relaxation about AI and take you back into confusion, forth and back. But just the main message that you really need to be involved in this. You need to be an influence in this. You need to understand better because AI has different facets, short term, long term. I hope you appreciated the different perspectives, the different people talking. I think we picked up the, but those are really people into the space and they are, please do talk to them. And thank you so much for the patience in running over time. And uh, I think yeah, it's a perfect time to just head over to the, was it level eight? Level eight for the cocktail and the dinner. And then we have actually their eminent speaker uh, uh, waiting for you in patience. Thank you so much. Yeah.